Okay, let's move on. The recent reshuffles of Anthony Albanese's ministry uh, had at its centre a major change in the Home Affairs and Immigration portfolio. Tony Burke, of course, took on both as the senior minister, but it created room for Melbourne MP Julian Hill to be promoted to an assistant minister role, which is... Uh, with a large area of responsibilities and some hot-button issues still running in that area at the moment. We haven't yet had an opportunity to explore those with Julian Hill, but we did today. He joined us from Melbourne. Julian Hill, welcome back to Afternoon Briefing, and I must say at the outset, congratulations on your promotion into the Assistant Minister role. I understand that in this role, you will be overseeing social cohesion work uh, through community liaison offices. Just take us through the emphasis uh, on that aspect of your job. Who are you actually reaching out to? Yeah, well, my community is one of the most multicultural in Australia and it's terrific to be able to work now right across Australia with multicultural communities. Uh, within the portfolio, Tony Burke, as the senior minister, has overall responsibility. Uh, my primary focus, although I do a few other things when and if Tony needs it, but my primary focus is on citizenship, on multicultural policy, community engagement and investment, as well as English language and settlement programs. Uh, social cohesion is an issue that's shared right across the portfolio from uh, Tony, uh, myself, but also Peter Khalil as the Prime Minister's special envoy on social cohesion. Did the, obviously, uh, visas are a part of the work that goes on in this area, and there's been so much recent discussion around the Parliament about the processes that have led to Palestinian visas, 3,000 in all, being issued. Is that raised by other community members with you, that is, non-Palestinian communities, people like the family of Afghan uh, humanitarian visa seekers, those, those seeking one or those who've been granted one but can't yet get here? Yeah, look, there's no shortage of views around Australia and from communities on visa policies and uh, processing priorities and so on. Um, it's you know, a free country and people freely express those views. I am proud to represent the largest community in Australian, uh, of Australians born in Afghanistan. And there's an ongoing trauma as we approach the third anniversary of the fall of Kabul and the return of the Taliban regime, one of the world's worst medieval regimes, continuing to roll back human rights uh, for women and girls, even in the last couple of weeks. Uh, there are many people who worked for the Australian government still trying to get out of Afghanistan, and we're still working through the, the backlog of visas uh, for people who've worked with Australia, and we'll bring as many of those people to safety as possible through the humanitarian program. Just on the other point, the broader point that you mm. make around social cohesion, um, social cohesion is it's, it's not an end state, it's a process. And social cohesion works when we work at it. The government's making significant investments in this area and you know, it's a reality of life in Australia that global conflicts impact daily life here through diaspora communities. Uh, but the, the focus of the government is on trying to bring Australians together. That's the Prime Minister's focus. That's what I've been charged to do. Uh, give people a fair go. That's what multicultural Australia is all about, giving people a fair go and a fair crack at life here. And I do contrast that. You know, you talk about Gaza and there's mm. been enormous distress in the community at Peter Dutton's pattern of behaviour of trying to divide Australians and use these issues for partisan political advantage. And that's something that we will continue to reject and you know, conduct ourselves with a sensible tone. It's words matter, but tone matters if you're going to bring Australians together. Of course, just on that particular area of hostility or conflict in the Middle East, there's been an escalation of Israeli military activity in the West Bank in the last 24 hours or so. I'm not sure what still remains in that campaign. But is the Australian government preparing to process a further wave of visa applications from there if the security situation should deteriorate? Well, Australia's long been um, critical of the expansion of settlements and of settler violence in the West Bank. That's not a controversial proposition. It's uh, one that is pretty broadly held across the world. And uh, the Foreign Minister announced uh, some sanctions on 
extremist settlers for that kind of violence. I haven't seen the media reports in the last 24 hours that you're referring to. Uh, obviously people day in, day out from all parts of the world apply for visas to come to Australia or visa classes and the point I'll just continue to stress that uh, everyone who applies for a visa to come to Australia is assessed against the security criteria that apply. Um, mm. the, you know, the security checks are done and you know, the weaponisation of, of this issue for you know, a relatively small number of people fleeing death and violence, many of whom have family connections to Australia, I've met them myself, uh, is not in our national interest and it's not in the interest of social cohesion and bringing Australians together. Yeah, well, let's not dwell on that any further, Julian. I might take you to a matter close to where you are. You'd be aware that a Tamil asylum seeker who had arrived in Australia as a teenager tragically set himself alight and died in Melbourne yesterday. Margot Yogalingam was his name. He previously had a refugee claim rejected and has been on a bri bridging visa while appealing that. His colleagues are angry, of course, about this extended state of limbo. What are the prospects for the tens of thousands of people in that category? Well, first on that incident, it's utterly horrific and not just any Australian but any decent human being would, would feel appalled that any person would get to the point with their own mental health that that seems like not just an option but a, th but a thing to do. It's horrific. Mm. Um, I can't comment on the individual case and I'm not avoiding it, I'm just putting that disclaimer there, partly for privacy but partly because the department is still examining and I spoke to them this morning and I haven't yet been briefed in detail. Um, right. But on the broader question, uh, I, I have many asylum seekers in my electorate, they're a community that I'm connected with, but every case is different and you know, I think the government deserves credit in fulfilling our commitment that we made before the election. Nearly 18,000 of the 19,000 temporary protection visa holders who were stuck in permanent limbo in this country for the best part of a decade never able to leave as genuine refugees but never able to confirm and build their life here, in many cases see their children and be reunited with their families, have now been granted permanent visas. Uh, many thousands more have moved through uh, from the bridging visa caseload because they've met the criteria. Uh, as, as for the you know, other people, each case is different and the Senior Minister Tony Burke is obviously aware of these issues and they sit within his responsibility and we're working through them. And where are you up to in that caseload for those who are eligible, who are eligible for conversion? How many have been fully processed? Uh, don't hold me to the precise number. Last time I checked, and this wasn't as a portfolio minister, this sure. is an interested, as an interested local MP because many people come to my office um, day in, day out who live in my community. Uh, we're in the order of 18,000 of the 19,000 have been granted now of the TPV Chev holders. Uh, the remainder do have complex uh, identity issues in most cases, a few character issues, but most of them identity issues and they're just going to take time to work through. They're not forgotten. Uh, there's some um, there's a few thousand more, I understand, that are now moving into that pipeline uh, because they've come off the bridging visa caseload where they were just stuck in this black hole under the former government. Mm. Uh, but the legacy of that caseload is complex and every case is different. I can't stress that enough. There is no magic wand as you know, people involved, refugee advocates and lawyers and others know each case is different and needs to be worked through. Yeah, I understand that. And it is a big caseload, as you point out here, Julian Hill. It's Look, shrinking. I'm, yeah, <laughs> thanks for the update. Look, I might take you also to a domestic political matter that I am sure you have engaged on with colleagues around the census in 2026. It's been explained by Jim Chalmers that the government decided against questions on gender and sexual orientation being included in the 26 census to avoid some of the nastiness, he said, that sometimes accompanies that in the lead up to the census. Now, as I alluded to in my forthcoming question here, Julian, uh, some Labor colleagues are unhappy about it. Should this decision be reversed or reviewed in your view? 
Yeah, I'll just add the very predictable disclaimer that I'm here, obviously, as a government MP, but uh, as the new guy in the ministry responsible for multicultural affairs and citizenship, and it mm -hmm. would not surprise you that I'm not going to tread heavily into uh, someone else's portfolio sitting with the Assistant Treasurer and the Treasurer. Um, so that's, that's the disclaimer and the Got warranty. It. Obviously, I'm aware of the community um, debate around this question and the feedback, and uh, it's been listened to. The census is not till 2026, and our focus at the moment is on cost of living. It is on dealing with the economic circumstances, getting inflation down. We've got to be able to walk and chew gum. So obviously, we're listening to this kind of feedback. Uh, but the final point I'd make: before I was in this portfolio, I have advocated for other things in the census. You know, I've been trying to pursue the issue of assessing multilingual capability of Australians, because that's a big issue in my community, not feeling recognised for having multiple languages. And the feedback I got is there's many things that people would like to load on the census that, frankly, you can't always put there. Yeah. So it's not a straightforward thing just to add questions, as many people might think it, it is. But I'll leave the detail of it to the Assistant Treasurer. I understand. And so just by way of follow-up, there is time and capacity for it to be reconsidered if that was the view within the government? Is that what you're suggesting? Uh, well, I'm suggesting the census isn't until 2026. In mm. fact, you know, you didn't hear that here first. That's a pretty yeah, obvious yeah. fact. There's obviously a very long um, preparatory uh, stage to get the IT, to get the forms and all that kind of infrastructure in place. I'm not across the precise detail of when the cutoff is, but we're continuing to listening, listen to feedback. But I do make that point that um, there's many things which people would like to load on the census. I've advocated for them myself. And what I'm told is the longer you make the census, if everyone got their kind of wish list, the thing would have no integrity because there'd just be too many questions in it. Yeah. So it's always a bit of a, a tough balance. Um, but they're, they're continuing to look at it. I get that broader context. I thank you for it. And we also appreciate uh, your new position within the government, Julie Hill, Julian Hill. And that does somewhat curtail uh, the room you've got to run. But uh, thank you for joining us. I'm sure we'll catch up again very soon. Thanks very much, Greg.